And I wanted to uh, introduce our presenter, John Sovac. He is a licensed marriage and family therapist who works with LGBTQ youth and their families during the coming out process. He's an adju adjunct faculty member at the Phillips Graduate Institute and author of multiple publications about providing LGBTQ support. He's a national speaker and consultant for school districts and businesses. Um, and he's a nationally recognized expert on creating affirmative support for LGBTQ youth. And his work has been featured in too many shows to name and too many <laughs> publications to name. And so I will turn it over to John. Thank you so much for being here. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And I'm really happy to be speaking with all of you tonight. And the important thing for me is that I'm speaking with you, not at you. Um, I do have some slides that I'm going to share. They're going to be used to kind of move our conversation along. But I want to make sure that we have place for dialogue, for questions, for concerns that they come up. Once again, as Rebecca mentioned, you can put those questions in the Q&A as we're going along. Um, and then also note too that resources that I shared during the presentation are going to be sent out in email. So all of you who are here tonight will be able to have access to those resources as well as in a few days, go on the Conejo Valley YouTube site and watch my shiny, happy face <laughs> anytime you want to. Um, so with that said, I just want to open a space to know that once again, this is a dialogue and that this is a place for all of us to be able to learn from each other. So with that said, I'm actually going to get it started. I'm going to jump into my slides here real quick. And let me open that up. And of course, look, you saw the slide ahead. There we go. So Rebecca, thumbs up. We have slide showing. Perfect. So as Rebecca mentioned, we are here tonight to talk about supporting your LGBTQ child. And I think it's really important to understand that as people who either have children or are part of the system where we're teaching children, supporting them, being therapists for them, even if we have relatives with children who may be LGBTQ, that it's important for us to really take on our education and our depth of knowledge so that we can be as supportive as we can for their journey. And it's really important to understand, and you will hear me mention this more than once during our conversation tonight, that the coming out process is a lifelong process. Um, it's not just a one and done, your kid comes out to you and suddenly everything's over. This is an ongoing experience that will go through the lifetime of anyone who is part of the LGBTQ community. Now, as Rebecca said, my name is John Sovek. My pronouns are he, him and I'm a cisgender queer person. And all of that stuff will make a little bit more sense as we go along, but I want you, under, you to understand you know, my point of view, my experience, and where I'm coming from. And as we talk tonight, I will be using my experience with clients, with parents, um, and things that I've learned over time, and going to share those with you as ways to help expand your way to support LGBTQ kids. I think it is really important for us to understand, though, on a real core basic level, what these kids are going through. And one of the best ways to look at that is there's a, a study that's done every two years. It's through the Gay, Lesbian, Straight Education Network. It's a national organization. And every two years they do an online survey that kids are able to answer. And because they're able to answer online, there's not you know, pressure to hide who they are. And it's a really great way to get a snapshot of what's actually going on for these kids as they're growing up. So the study I'm going to use tonight is from 2019, and they had over 14,000 respondents. So it does give us a really, really nice overview of what's going on. So unfortunately, I want you to really understand that for a lot of LGBTQ kids, almost 60%, they do feel unsafe at school because of their sexual orientation or because of perceptions about their sexual orientation. Um, and that's an important thing to understand, that it's not just who they are, but it's how they're perceived by their fellow students. Also, uh, over 40% of LGBTQ kids felt unsafe at school because of their gender expression. 70% um, of LGBT kids reported being verbally harassed, called names, or threatened. And you have to understand that our kids are supposed to go into these school environments and into these safe spaces and this kind of energy is following them around, whether it's at school, whether it's if they're going to a Starbucks afterwards, sometimes it's if they're on the playground. 
that this verbal harassment follows a lot of LGBTQ people around wherever they go. Almost 30% of LGBTQ students report being physically harassed, that's pushed or shoved, or sometimes even more intense experiences. And that's another thing we just need to be really aware of that these kids are having these experiences going on for them. A thing that's very different for many of you who are parents now is to understand that almost 50% of kids experience electronic has harassment in the last year. Now, for most of us, when we grew up, if we were bullied or had a bad day at school, we could go home, we could have dinner, we could go to our room, you know, <laughs> watch some television, go to sleep and repair ourselves for the next day. But with this whole idea of social media following kids, bullying can be a 24 hour cycle. And so we need to be really aware of how that may be playing out in our kids' lives. And unfortunately, one statistic that's so important to understand is 20 to 35% of LGBTQ youth have made suicide attempts. And this number reflects that we're looking at these kids who are going through this identity piece and feeling so lost and so uncomfortable in their world that suicide seems to be the only option. And as a therapist who works with LGBTQ youth, it is unfortunate to know that a lot of kids who come to me show up in my office because they attempted suicide and in the hospital they came out to their parents. And then the hospitals will refer them to me to start a process of working together to create an affirming environment. Um, this looks at a national average between nine and 14% of all adolescents who make suicide attempts. So if you take that into context, we're looking at double to triple the number for LGBTQ kids. I like to start off with this information because I want you to understand on the core level that it is different for an LGBTQ kid in school than it is for heterosexual or a cisgender kid in school. And that they're having this deeper, sometimes more challenging experience. One thing though that we have found out, and this is such a powerful piece of information, that having connectedness in their school, having a GSA, a Gay Straight Alliance, or a QSA, a Q Straight Alliance, having adult support, whether it's at home, whether it's in their spiritual community, whether it's at school, that having an adult who is there to give them support during this coming out process can have a huge influence on the well being of these kids during this coming out process. And I think that's so important to know as we're having this conversation tonight to see that one adult supportive voice can make a huge difference in any LGBTQ kids development. So I've been throwing around some words already. I have cisgender, transgender, LGBTQ, and that's a lot, a lot of words that we're expected as supporters of the community to take on. Now, I am aware that you all have done an LGBTQ 101, but I just want to throw a couple of reminder words into play just to keep us all updated and refreshed. So the first one I like to look at is biological sex. So biological sex is simply the bi biological, genetic, or physical characteristics that define males or females. So this is really just looking at chromosomes and external um, bodies to recognize what a biological sex may be. What we understand with current science and is that those external markers are not the only way that biological sex is identified. And we just need to be aware of that uh, because we put a lot of assumptions in place when a baby's born saying, oh, it's a boy, it's a girl, simply by seeing those external markers. Next is gender. So gender are the, the social, psychological, and emotional traits that define what makes someone male or female, masculine or feminine. And the thing that's so important to understand about gender is it's actually a social construct. Um, I know that there are many of you who come to this conversation tonight from different cultural experiences. If you think about that, there are different ways that males and females are seen by cultures. Um, if you think about it, the color that boys wear is blue. Um, boys are told, don't cry. The color the girls wear is pink. These are all social constructs and they change over time and they change from society to society. 
Um, if you look back at some of like old European paintings, the color pink was actually a color that very young boys wore for their christening gowns quite often. So this idea that pink is a female color is a, is a relatively modern construct. So give yourself a little time to consider, well, what are the constructs that my culture brings into play about male, female, masculine, feminine, and how they affect the conversation, how you interact with your kids. Gender identity is where we start looking inside ourselves. It's a person's deeply held sense of being male, female, some of both, or maybe even neither. And most of the time we have been raised in a conversation that says, it's a binary, that you're either male or female, and it's this line, and you have to figure out where you belong there. The conversation now is that we're actually looking at gender universe, um, the ability for us to define our gender in multiple, multiple facets. Another way I like to describe it that most people can get, um, if you're working on a Word document and you want to change the color of a sentence, you highlight it, you click it, and then at the bottom that says there's more colors. And then that cups that really beautiful color wheel, and you can move within that and choose all kinds of different shades and colors. Well, if you take that and spin it, that would be a three-dimensional idea of how gender identity can work for our own personal internal sense of ourselves. So remember, gender is external. It's a social construct. It comes from how society views male, female, masculine, feminine where gender identity is an internal process, our sense of how we feel in that gender world. Gender expression, and I know those of you who have teens especially, this is the fun part of gender. This is how a person communicates that gender identity, that internal sense of gender to the world through clothing, through mannerisms, haircuts, speech patterns, social interactions. And this is, for me, someone who works with kids, is such an exciting thing because many of us were raised with only constructing our world with this idea of what's male and female. But I know for some of you, it can bring up anxiety and maybe even fear. But what if this was just a really beautiful, generational, like, big blast off we were having of these kids asking these really powerful, beautiful questions about gender? And then it's important to also understand that sexual orientation, this is the sex or gender we're attracted to sexually, our emotional, romantic, intellectual, sexual feelings towards other people. So we need to understand that gender belongs in its own column and sexual orientation belongs in its own column as well. That yes, we all have both gender and sexual orientation, but we need to be so aware that we don't mix those up. Um, oftentimes, you'll see a news item, they'll be talking about someone's sexual orientation, and they'll make a comment about gender, or they'll be talking about gender, and they make a comment about sexual orientation. But because you've been with me tonight, and you've had your LGBTQ 101, you are going to catch that and know that gender and sexual orientation are two different paths of a part of how we describe ourselves as a whole person. So I've already been talking quite a bit. And I would imagine that just with some of the things I've shared, some of the statistics about this experience for kids growing up, LGBTQ, and some of the things about gender identity, that maybe some questions have already started to formulate for y'all. So I'm going to take the slides down for a moment. And then I have got a moderator who's going to open up that Q&A and see what kind of questions have started to show up. So if y'all are ready, please Thank come you, John. In. Okay. Um, first one is if you could explain to our families, what is the difference between bisexuality, pangender, and gender fluid? And then the second half is that, of that question is they're asking, how should I respond to my child to let them know that I'm fine with that, however they identify that I'm fine with them and who they are? Okay. So once again, we're looking at some words that fall down different pathways. So someone who's bisexual or pansexual, this is once again about sexual attraction. A bisexual person is someone who may identify as, as being attracted to males or females. And in the description of bisexual, we often do look at gender as a defining attraction. In pansexual, we're talking about someone who is attracted to all presentations of gender that show up in the world. Now, this distinction between bisexual and pansexual, both communities are kind of like having a big discussion about it right now, but those would be the most basic level to really understand it. 
When we look at things like gender fluid, uh, those are things looking about that internal sense of self, that identity of gender on the spectrum, that gender universe we were talking about. So gender fluid means that there's movement in there, that it's not just a, a static statement that we've made, but that it moves, it flows, um, and has influence depending on where we're at in a moment. So that's kind of the, the, the down and dirty way of describing gender fluid. Um, I'm going to come back to how do we support our kids a little bit later on, because that's a deeper part of our discussion we're going to get to towards the, the last third. So I'm going to hold on to that for a little bit. Okay, and then we got a question that came in of the reference that you made regarding the color wheel. Mm -hmm. So how would you help a person kind of navigate through that color wheel, like starting from um, just that exploration? Mm -hmm. So if I were gonna share for myself and really go with that color wheel alone, whenever I'm like saying, hey, I want that to be purple, well, I'll go into the purple, but then I'll like be like, well, do I want a red purple? Do I want an orange purple? Do I want a blue purple? And do I want the hue to be dark? Do I want to be light? And I think it's about understanding that if someone tells you that they are a certain thing, that respect that identity and also be with them along the journey to find out what it means in their world. So if I have a trans masculine kid come in, what I want to know is, well, what does that look like in your world? So a trans masculine kid is someone who was assigned female at birth and is now male. So with that, how does, how does that masculine energy show up in your world? What, how does the male gaze play out in that? Who are you still attracted to? Um, how do you want to express that in your gender expression through clothing, through cutting your hair? So that color wheel is taking that initial statement and then letting all of the shades start to come out into play. And for me personally, as a therapist, in that moment of work, that's where it gets really exciting, is taking this, you know, very static definition and giving it some shape and color. So really focusing on their lens um, and their experience of, of what they're going through. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Um, how do you suggest approaching your child who frequently changes between being gay, questioning identity, and using different pronouns? Mm -hmm. So for me, the best thing we can do at that moment is support our kid exactly where they are. The hardest part for most of the adults in their world is the adults want to have a specific label. We want to lock these kids in. Well, if any of you remember back to you when you were a kid, what did you hate most when adults tried to tell you something? But you always like applesauce. Well, I don't like it now, okay? And I think it's so important for us to be able to meet these kids and let them take us on a journey. So yes, listen to our kids, listen to what they're sharing, learn from them, what does this mean in their world? And then take those things. Don't your, turn your kid into an educator take those expressions and then find adults in your community. And we're going to talk about resources a little bit later. So you can talk in a supportive environment and say, you know, my kid just identified as, you know, agender, hetero romantic. And they told me what that means, but my head is exploding right now. And that's where we find a group or we find a therapist or we find a spouse who can be really supportive in our own anxiety about trying to meet our kids where they are. Now, I know we probably have a bunch more questions, but I want to pause here and kind of go back into my information offering phase, bring my slide deck back up, and we'll have a couple of more times for questions coming up, okay? So let me go back into my share screen. Where were we? Question marks. Yes. Okay. So because our conversation tonight does look at, well, how do we as parents like create this energy of support? I think it's so important to understand and look at family dynamics so they start to show up when our kid comes out to us. So I'm going to share with you some moments here, some things families go through, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. Anybody recognizing what that cycle actually is? It's the grief process. What I like to help parents understand and help their kids understand that when your kid comes out, 
as a parent, you are most likely going to go through a grief process. Now, it's not grieving your kid. What it's grieving is the dream of the kid. Most parents that I talk to share the idea that when they have their baby, they hold in their arms, look at his eyes for the first time and project forward an entire career. It's going to be the valedictorian. It's going to play soccer. My kid's going to go to college and then graduate and move in next door and have a white picket fence and, and, and a dog and, you know, two kids. And when your kid comes out to you, for most people, that dream shatters. And so important in those first few moments to give yourself time to have all of those feelings. This is not something you need to be expressing to your kid. This is where you do turn to your spouse. You do turn to a therapist. You do turn to a support group to help yourself move through that. And I work with kids to also understand that their parents may be going through this grieving process. Because for most kids, by the time they come out to you, They've been thinking about this for a while. It's been on their mind and in their hearts for quite a long time. And so they come out and they're like, here's who I am. And then you are going through this process. So I try and make sure that parents are aware that they may be going through this and that kids are aware that their parents may be going through this as well. So what are some of the family dynamics show up when a kid comes out? Oftentimes there'll be a sense of shock in the family. We didn't see this coming. Sometimes there will be the opposite. It's like, well, we are waiting for them to come out. Um, there'll be a decision-making process. Um, how are we as a family going to be with this? How are we going to in integrate it into our larger family structure? How are we going to address it with, in a community setting? There's a process where we start to learn to embrace our child's full identity. And this to me is the very first stepping stone that we can set with our kids to support them in their coming out process. I don't know how many of you have looked online, but there are lots of coming out videos that kids have recorded. And the thing that always is the most powerful experience of that moment, and it does not matter how affirming your family dynamic is and how supportive of the community your family is, when your kid is going to come out to you, their heart is racing, they're sweating, um, they're, they're so anxious and so stressed out. And the most important thing you can do in that moment when your kid says to you, I'm bisexual, is to open up your arms and say, I love you and hold them close and cry together if that's what happens. A lot of times parents ask me, what are the words I should say? And what I say is go to the simplest. I love you, hug them close and hold them. Because in that moment, coming out, it's one of those very fearful cliffs that anyone who is LGBTQ has to go through. And we take that blind step off because we don't know how the world's going to react to it. So by simply opening your arms and offering love, that's going to set the most beautiful, beautiful forward momentum for your family. And then from there, you can continue to grow and learn. There are going to be lots and lots of questions at the beginning. And like I said, try not to turn your kid into your educator. So what that means is we're going online, finding resources where you can get really powerful, valuable information. And we're going to be sharing resources later. And as I said, we're going to be sending out an email with those resources. So you'll have them available to you. The kind of questions that will help is to really learn about what their identity means for these kids in their world but not asking them questions um, that you can easily find by resourcing. Advocacy, um, standing up for your kid's identity is a really powerful way to support them and to be present with them in this experience and this journey of coming out. So there are lots of benefits of coming out. Um, kids can live more honestly. We can develop self-esteem. We can build some really genuine relationships now that we've unveiled this part of ourselves to the world. It can alleviate a lot of stress and fear. What if someone finds out? And it helps build a sense of community when we can bring that authenticity into our experience. At the same time, it's really important to know that there are risks of coming out. Um, and kids are going to feel these as they're weighing out this process of coming out. There could be rejection. They could be disowned by their family. Um, they can face discrimination. 
um, as we showed earlier, harassment and abuse, sometimes even in the school setting. And they may lose a sense of community as in the community they've been with for a while. So understand we have benefits and we have risk when kids are looking at coming out. So I'm actually gonna pause here for a moment and open up the space for some questions again. Because like I say, I can talk hey, forever, but I love to make room for all of us to have a conversation. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, I've got two questions specific to pronouns. Um, so just to set the foundation with the first one, we have a parent who asked if you could just explain what he, him, and his means and what each one stands for. Are they mm -hmm. something different? If you could touch on that. Okay, so you may be pulling that off of seeing my introduction. Um, once again, I put that in when I introduce myself, I put that in how I identify myself on Zoom here. I put it in my signature on my emails, he, him, his. And what it is, is it's just the way we share with the world what our pronouns are. Sometimes you'll still just say he, him. Sometimes you'll say it's just he, him, his. Um, she, her, you'll see they, them, zer. So all it is, is we are identifying our pronouns to the world. The reason that I do it is because if I step into a space and I say, my name is John Sovak, I'm a queer person and my pronouns are he, him, that sets up a space where a conversation can occur. So if I'm walking into like a cold environment in a school, I'm working with kids, the minute I say that, I've sent a signal to them to understand that, oh, this conversation may be safe with him because he has let me know this piece of information. I may not want to talk about it right now, but it has been identified. So I would encourage you, if you are personally comfortable in your life and your situations, add it to your email line, add it to the way you introduce yourself, maybe at a meeting, if you feel comfortable with that. We're not trying to force anybody out. We're just trying to create a fabric where people can communicate with each other. So yeah, that's why we list the pronouns the way we do. And he, him, his, it all means the same identity of what my personal pronouns are in this moment. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, I, I accept who, who my child is today, but the past confuses me. How do I refer to who they were then? Do I change the pronouns to match the present or the past? So if we take the question mark off of your last statement, simply say, I changed the pronouns to match the present. Um, we have to understand that a lot of times when we look at a trans kid's past, they identify that as their dead self or their dead name. And I know that sounds pretty dramatic, but this is because that's how traumatizing some of that experience is for them. And so it is important for us to stay in present time. Now, each kid and each person is going to have a very different reaction to how they embrace their past. I have a really great um, trans masculine friend who still has pictures of themselves in, you know, their assigned birth sex up on their refrigerator. They have no shame about it. I have other people that I've worked with and they have cut that other gender out of all of their pictures so that they don't have that showing up for them at all. So once again, we use the pronouns to match the present moment, no matter how we're talking about this person. We use the present name, we use the present pronouns to affirm the identity that they are in this moment with us right now. Okay, thank you for that. Um, the next question is, my daughter is almost nine years old and she feels she's bisexual. How do we address the situation? Well, I think we need to understand that when kids are coming out to us, we need to put it within the framework of their developmental phases. Now, as a parent, you're not supposed to know all their developmental phases, but as professionals, we are. So with a nine-year-old, we need to understand well, what does that mean? Is bisexual actually looking at sexual attraction and content? Or is it the attraction to, you said your daughter, the energy of being with another female? As I said earlier, those attractions are based on, you know, physical, emotional, intellectual, sexual attractions. So with a nine-year-old, we may actually be looking at the sexual piece. We may be looking more at the emotional, intellectual, and other attractions. So we need to kind of look at the framework of what age the kid is, where their maturity is. So we do understand that these days, um, puberty is occurring at younger and younger ages. 
So we need to be aware, not where our brain says, oh, they're a teenager now, so now we need to talk about the sexual component, but be really aware of the tanner stages, the stages of puberty that our kids are in working with their medical doctor to understand that as a way to support them with those definitions that have meaning in their world. So I think we got time for one and more, then, let's do it. Okay, um, it, best resource for parents um, that might help them understand the coming out process. Me. Um. <laughs> <laughs> So we're going to be sharing some different resources um, in this last section, and that will be emailed out to everyone. Um, it is important for you to really check and validate any of the resources you check, because there are different resources out there based on certain people's agendas. And what you really want to find is a conversation that's based on science, that's based on you know, psychology, that's based on the community bringing the information forward rather than people outside the community coming in with agendas. Um, so we'll be sharing some of that later. And once again, there will be an email so you can have that all at your fingertips. So if you're okay, I'm gonna jump back into the world of me talking and then we'll come back for another yeah. set of questions. So we're gonna move now into how do I, as a parent, actually connect with my kid. Because we knew, know whether your kid is gay, straight, bisexual, lesbian, transgender, gender non-binary, kids can be really hard to communicate with. Um, my favorite moment is, you know, the, how are you doing today? Fine. Anything happen? No. What's going on? Nothing. We all know those famous one word answers. So I'm going to try and give you some tips and tricks to really open up conversations with your LGBTQ kids. And you can probably work this with any kids. <laughs> These techniques will work with them too. So first off, it's the idea of using open-ended questions. <clears throat> so we need to find a way not to be asking why questions all the time. Um, but instead, as you've heard me use already, well, how does being bisexual show up in your world? How does it feel for you to go to school um, you know, wearing an outfit that's affirming for you. These how questions open up a little bit more space for a conversation to happen. And we need to understand too that the timing of questions is really important. Um, after you've had a long day of work, do you like it when people come to you with like really in-depth, deep questions about, you know, your life and your day? No, most of us need a little time, a little break. So give your kids a little break too. Give them some space before you start, you know, trying to explore these questions with them. I'm a big believer in what I call side-by-side -side questions. So one of the things we know about therapy is you as a client are sitting right across the room from me or right across the camera these days, and we're looking eye to eye, and it can sometimes feel really uncomfortable. Like you have to come up with an answer. And what I mean by side-by-side -side conversations is, well, what about taking your kid for a walk? Um, I often prescribe parents taking the dog for a walk with their kid. And what this does in a side-by-side -side conversation is you can ask a more in-depth question. And then maybe it's a little comfortable for your kid. Maybe you just keep walking and the dog sniffing and they're looking around and there's a bird flying and a flower blooming. And then they answer you. And that's because there isn't the pressure of looking someone right in the eye and feeling their need for you to come up with an answer. So I think side-by-side -side conversation can be really powerful. Um, walking the dog, taking a hike. Um, sometimes if you're taking a trip together and you're driving in the car, it can be really helpful. Once again, I don't prescribe this for kid gets in the car after school, hops in, you say like, how was your day? They're gonna be like, yeah, I'm not gonna talk to you right now. Let them have control of music for those 20 minutes on the way home and maybe ask those questions a little bit later. Um, let them lead. When we're moving these conversations, as anxiety producing as it may be for us as the adult in their world, it's just as anxiety producing for these kids to try and be talking to an adult about these really personal feelings they're going through. So if you have a day where they're really open and communicative, follow that lead, delve a little bit deeper. If you're having one of those days where they're kind of like pushing back a little bit and shutting down, ease out of it move on to something else, but follow their lead in these conversations. 
And as much as you've probably gone online and read up and have lots of great information, try not to interrupt your kids when they're sharing something really personal to them. It's very rare that kids get the opportunity to have an adult fully attentive and listening to them. And that can be such a powerful and beautiful moment and a way to connect and maybe hear something a little bit deeper from them. One of the techniques that we use in therapy is we allow silence to be okay. For most of us, that's not an easy thing, but I, I would encourage you, like, don't interrupt your kids. And if they start to have that little like fade out with a sentence, don't feel like you have to fill the space. Take a moment, take a breath, and they may come out with more information because you didn't try and force that moment. Some other tech you can do is validate. Um, so often kids are hearing things that are dismissive of who they are or their belief systems or what they're discovering about themselves. Instead, I encourage you to validate, validate their experience, validate what they've learned, validate what they presented to you. Also, this one's so important for me is don't bundle things. So mm -hmm. if you want to talk to your kid about like their lesbian identity, don't make it about their lesbian identity and about their grades and about getting to practice on time and about doing their chores and about walking the dog and about doing all these other things. Because if you do that, you're going to overwhelm and dilute the conversation. So if you really want to talk to your kid about their LGBTQ experience, let that be what the conversation is about. Try not to bundle it with a whole bunch of other topics. It is totally okay when you're talking to your kid and then each of you getting a little bit anxious, a little bit frustrated, take a break. What I suggest with that though, is you're like, you know what, maybe we need to take a break right now. Why don't we come back together in half an hour and we can see where we're at then. So taking a break doesn't mean shutting down or dismissing. It means both of you may be activated. Let's take a moment. Let's come back together in 30 minutes and let's see where the conversation takes us then. Because that taking a break can be a really valuable way to connect with your kid and also to manage your own anxiety about these conversations. Most important of all, don't fake it. Don't try and be so cool with your kids that you say, yeah, I know exactly who Lil Nile X is. And they're looking at your face and you're like, you have no idea what I'm talking about right now. Kids will pick up on it. And if you want to have these deeper, authentic conversations with your kids, try not to fake it. So other things that can help create an affirming household, a place where your kids know that maybe it's going to be okay to talk about this stuff is be willing to discuss with your kid, whether you think they're LGBTQ or not, whether they've come out or not, but discuss with them the images and messages that surround us about sexuality and gender, because they are there in every single waking moment of our experience, especially when we look at film, television, magazines, books, social media. Sexuality and gender are really powerfully presented around us all the time. We need to be willing to explore that in those conversations. How those understandings shifted over time? Maybe being a little bit vulnerable and talking about like, well, what gender was like when you were growing up and how there's this new gender universe and it's really a little bit overwhelming for you. Talk about those shifts and changes. Talk about the expectations that are being put on everybody to have you know, a gender identity, a sexual orientation and how that can feel like a lot for anybody. And how might a child feel who doesn't necessarily match, especially a heterocentric cisgender story? If you look at it, most school experiences are designed around a heteronormative cisgender experience. And if you're not that, how anxiety producing could that be? How uncomfortable could that be? How feeling like you're ostracized from some of the most basic experiences of school, how does that feel for your kids? So we talked about, you know, trying to have some resources. Well, here are some great websites that I use that are vetted and validated that could help you explore the journey your kid might be on. PFLAG, Parents and Friends of Lesbians and Gays, a great organization. And the national website has amazing parent resources on there. And although it says uh, lesbians and gays, they are very supportive of the transgender community as well. Trevor Project, 
another great place to get information and support, especially for teens. Um, Gleason, which I mentioned earlier, is a really beautiful place to also look at education and how we can support our kids during that process. Um, DSAN Network um, is a place where you can look at creating Gay Straight Alliance for your school, how to start it, how to make it happen, and once again, loaded with resources for families. And Advocates for Youth is another great place to get really um, vetted information on supporting LGBTQ kids. And just to remind you, this stuff will be shared with you on an email so you can look this up. And as I said earlier, find places for your own expression of feelings, support groups, online forums, conferences, other parents who are on this journey. Because there are things that you as an adult are going to need to process that it may not be appropriate to process with your kid. And to get on board with your spouse or partner or to find support in these types of groups is a place where you're going to be able to sort out those feelings and then come on back to your kid with a loving, open heart that's supportive of their journey. Now, I hear this all the time from parents. I'm feeling awkward. Here's the best thing. Breathe. <sighs> Apologize if you've made a mistake. If you misgender or misname a kid, just say, sorry ask for help. Can you remind me what your pronouns are? Just catch yourself and own it and don't make a big deal out of it. Be simple in that apology. Be simple in that ask for help. When you're unclear, simply ask. It's the best way to travel through this journey. And what's the most supportive model that we find for kids is there's a guy named Carl Rogers. who's kind of like one of those gurus of the therapy world. And he has a, a phrase called express unconditional positive regard for your clients. And I like to modify that in express unconditional care, express unconditional love. You may not understand everything your kid is sharing with you, but be present with them. Behind that energy of anxiety that you may have, that anxiety that they may have, know that spirit, that heart of your child and express unconditional care and love to that spirit as you're working through all the noise of the other information. Affirm your support. Let your kid know that you are making an effort to be on this journey with them. Don't assume things. Um, some of those questions earlier were about like, well, our kids, you know, changing, pronouns change, um, you know, expression changes. Don't assume. Be willing to ask and clarify in those moments. As I said a moment ago, get yourself educated. Such a, a powerful way to be an ally for your kid's journey. And meet them where they are. So what do I mean by this? So sometimes I have parents who are so affirming and so into this. They go to like every PFLAG meeting. They go online to Trevor Project. They read everything. And then they race way ahead of their kids coming out process. And what I want to say is, if you gather that information, gather it, hold it with you, let it be part of how you interact with your kid, but don't drag them along in their coming out process. Instead, walk side by side with them and let them show you the comfort level that they're at. I think this is really important when we're talking about managing the coming out process in the bigger family and community story. You may think it's really great to be cool and let everybody else in the family know that your kid is gay but your kid may not be ready for that. So if let's say the holidays are coming up, have a conversation. It's like, are you ready for the rest of the family to know at this moment? Do you want to like, let them know your current pronouns and your name? Do you want them to know that you're queer? Find out from your kid how they want to handle that process. Because I can't tell you the number of times I have well-meaning parents who are like, hey, I told grandma and grandpa that you're lesbian. And the kid's like, I wasn't ready to let them know. So meet them where they are and let them lead a little bit in this process and listen to what they have to say. I love the fact that I, I work with adolescents. The things that they're thinking, the experiences they're having are beautiful and powerful and wonderful. And when we can have the time and the space to hear that, it's amazing what we can learn from these kids. So with that said, we have come to another one of those beautiful moments to ask some questions. Um, 
If you want to contact me, this information will be sent out as well. Um, you can find me at johnsovac.com. You can also find my other site, which is gayteentherapy.com. You can find me on Instagram at John Sovac Therapy and at Twitter at John Sovac. So feel free to reach out to me, but also know that there's lots of other um, resources that are going to be shared as a result of our conversation tonight. So I'm going to make this all go away. And everybody, this is us chatting, talking, asking questions. Let's go. Great. Thanks, John. Um, one of the things that you touched on was the grieving process. So referencing that kids see their identity as prior to coming out as being dead. How do you help navigate your child and support them in grieving the loss of their prior identity? Well, you know, it's really fascinating because we hear this process of coming out, but in that moment of sharing a deeper level of who we are, there's another process that we like to call coming in. So I am inviting you inside of me and I am letting you know more about who I am. And that's one of the ways that we can handle that moment because the kid may not be grieving the loss of that dead name. They may not be grieving the loss of those pronouns. But what they are doing is, is they're blossoming, they're developing, they're coming out in this whole new energy of who they are. So try coming into their world, meet them, be curious, see what they have to share. And once again, instead of just thinking about coming out, all their responsibility to broadcast to the world, coming in is an invitation into my world. I love that lens. Um, it gives you a whole nother perspective on that journey. Uh, one of the parents had sent in a question um, in regards to coming out and you touched with the family and having that conversation ahead of time. What might you tell a parent um, who might have family members that might not be as understanding or maybe critical of the, of the child? Mm -hmm. So I think in any coming out process, we do want to have um, the idea to really delineate who and how we're coming out. As I mentioned, I think it's important to be able to talk to your kid to help them be the leader on that point. What you can do as a parent is say, you know, like Uncle John, we know because of some things he said in the past may not be supportive of you coming out queer. Do you think that that's a good place for us to do that? Or how, do you, how does your safety feel? How do you feel about what might come back at you? So what we can discuss with our kids in a moment where we have a concern about a relative of the family who may not be as affirming is to pause their excitement out coming out and say like, let's, let's take a moment and think this through. I am supporting you and I want to make sure and think this through. Um, because the biggest thing for me, especially with those opening um, statistics that I shared with you is to ultimately maintain the safety of these kids in this coming out process. If you're going to come out at school, understanding what that means and where the support is, who is that supportive adult? A lot of schools, um, I haven't, didn't get a chance to ask all of you about this, but they have people that are identified kind of as the safe people at school. So if you're feeling bullied, you can go to the school nurse, you can go to, you know, the English teacher's classroom, and you don't have to say anything, you can just know that you're safe there. And those are things that are going to be really important in this whole process to make sure we maintain the safety of our kids as they are developing this identity. And that is a good point and something that our schools have been really responding to, which is um, a really cool campaign that's been happening just for a safe space for kids to talk. Um, I have a parent who says, you know, we're talking about how great it is to have these conversations, but what do you do when you have a child that does not want to talk about how they feel and what her experiences are? She's 16 and just wondering, is it best to just leave it until she comes and approaches them to talk about it? Or is it something that they should still pursue talking with them? What I would suggest is if your kid is not ready to do the coming in process, invite you in, is to hold your like anxiety about it. Talk to the people who can support you so that you can relieve some of that anxiety and keep letting them know that it's a safe environment. And once again, sometimes that's by overt things that we do. You know, hey, we attended this webinar tonight with this guy who was really talking about this and we learned a lot. 
cool mom and they go about their day. You set the fabric that you're educating yourself and you're interested. So all of these things are going to be cues. Maybe that you're watching something. Um, I hear this happen a lot. Kids will say, you know, I wanted to come out, but one time I heard my dad make some comment about like the characters on Will and Grace. And I didn't know if it was safe. So we need to be aware of, once again, those more covert messages of how we're putting things out. If we're in a family where, let's say, male identity, identity is hyper-masculinized, there's machismo in the family, we have to look at how it might be for you know, a trans female to come out in that situation. Once again, the messages we send out need to be clear, concise, and ongoing. And with that, your kid over time may feel like the warmth of your support and be willing to talk a little bit deeper. The thing to understand is just because they're coming out doesn't mean they want to talk. They may be kids who don't like to share themselves anyways. Um, and that's a place where a really well-qualified LGBTQ trained therapist can come into play and really help with the dynamic and create some support. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, how about for uh, parents who want to help their child um, figure out strategies or tools on how they come out to their straight friends or friends at school? How can you help them figure out a process to support them? Mm -hmm. So one thing, and I think it's going back to the safety story. Um, sometimes with kids in my office, we'll like delineate who do you feel you would most like to come out to? And what would that feel like? We'll try a practice conversation. You know, I want to tell my best friend, okay, I'm your best friend. How would you do it? And you do a little practice work. Um, the thing that I really try and explain to kids, and I think parents can share this with their kids as well too, is that let's say, you know, Brenda, I, you're my best friend and I come out to you and I'm really anxious and nervous and I hand you this piece of information. I've given you my story. Now, this is a lot for any one person to take, especially if you're a kid. So you're all anxious and you're like, you know what? I need to go tell Rebecca because this is such a big story. And you go to Rebecca and it's like, John told me not to tell anybody, but he just came out to me. And Rebecca's like, oh my God, that's so cool. But now Rebecca has my story. And then Rebecca like looks at Claudia and says, hey, by the way, you know that guy who like with the red hair, he came out. And all of a sudden my story is out of my control. And it wasn't because anyone is being cruel, mean, or unkind. It was because it's a big story for anybody to hold on. And we're looking at kids and adolescents. Of course, they're gonna to wanna to share this to relieve their anxiety. So I do share that with a lot of my kids who are in that process of coming out. So they understand that once I give my story out to anybody, I have to be okay with losing control of that story. So those are some of the ways that I, I do encourage you to like work with your kid, to deepen the conversation, to have practice, maybe create a list of people that it would be safe to come out to. But I'll offer you this thought, parents. It's more likely that your kid has already come out to their best friend or maybe an aunt or an uncle before they come to you. We see this quite often in the coming out process that parents may be second, third, or fourth in line in the coming out process because it is such an anxiety producing experience. Thank you for that. That's a really um, big thing to remember. Like it, their story can take on a life of their own without them having any control over it. That's a good mm -hmm. reminder. Um, we have some teachers in the audience as well. Um, so thinking of the flip side, like how can teachers, but also students and friends support a student who comes out to them and um, who might be struggling at school? Mm -hmm. So some of the most basic things to do is, are you putting up any type of collateral material in your classroom or office that says you are LGBTQ supporting? Um, once again, identifying if there are, you know, teachers, staff, administrators on campus who are willing to take off on the safe zone, you know, role. Um, if you have teacher, staff, or admin that are LGBTQ and they are comfortable being out at work, once again, we don't force anybody out ever, but to be willing to live that identity authentically in the school system can be really powerful for these kids to witness an adult who is living that. I still remember from my junior high experience, um, one of the art design teachers 
was an openly gay man. And to see him like being successful and watching other teachers like love him and interact with him and talk with him and mm. on parent teacher nights, like see my parents talking to this person, it gave me such a like, oh, oh, okay, I can be this and it's okay. And I think all of these are really, really, um, you know, simple, simple ways um, that we can start approaching this. The simplest being collateral materials that represent support for the LGBTQ community. Great. Um, how about if you have a, a child that's come out to the parents and one is supportive and the other one is not as supportive, how can you help direct them on how to approach their child and yet still support them? So this is where um, having a group process can be really, really valuable. I have lots of parents that I refer to um, these PFLAG meetings. And what they go in there and they go in there a little bit afraid, one may be incredibly reluctant, and then they hear other parents' story. They hear people that are behind them in the process, at the same place where they are in the process, way ahead of them in the process. And they'll hear like, you know, their mom say, you know, when my kid first came out, I was having trouble supporting them, but now I see them for the beautiful creature that they are. And I love every aspect mm -hmm. of them. Hearing that from a fellow parent then opens up our ability to say, and my fears are, you know, my mom's biggest fear was that I wouldn't have a happy life. And I have an amazing life and it's filled with joy and contentment. And for parents to be able to hear that, you know, my kid just graduated from college and they're going on to, you know, to be a psychology grad school. Oh my God, my kid is still going to be okay and go out in the world. This is why groups for parents can be really amazingly supportive and help that reluctant parent be heard to hear their fears and anxieties for the kid be heard in a supportive environment by someone who has probably had those exact same fears. Yeah, definitely. That is good advice for parents. Um, how about for siblings who are also along on this journey of the coming out process and especially for younger siblings who may not understand um, all of the intricacies of, of, of the coming out process and um, how they, they seem different or just have questions. How do you help a parent with that? I think once again, it goes back to the question we had earlier about the nine-year-old. We need to look at age-appropriate conversations. So I have a younger sibling. If it was like, you know, well, why is John like have a boyfriend? It's like, well, John, John likes boys. He finds that to be the person that makes him happy versus maybe an older sibling who's at college. And we're like, oh, so you're dating a guy, you know, these conversations need to be age appropriate. But I think it's important for families to help to open this experience up and be affirming because what if that younger sib is also questioning their own sexual orientation or gender identity? And they watch their older sibling go through a really amazing supportive experience it's going to create room for that to be easier and easier for them. So I say, keep the conversations open, keep them age appropriate and developmentally appropriate, but set up a family system where it's an affirming family where any kid can feel comfortable in the coming out process. Awesome. Okay. Another question, kind of switching gears a little bit. Um, <laughs> okay, here we go. You give us, <laughs> can you give us some information, maybe some updated um, research or clinical studies um, that are specifically on teens? This one was asking for st uh, teens or children that are non-binary, bisexual, but just any new research that might be interesting um, to anyone on this journey. Mm-hmm. Okay. So once again, Gleason is a really great place for research. Uh, human rights campaign is really good for research. Um, oh, my brain is shut down. It's been a long day. UCLA, Williams Institute is an amazing, amazing place where they're starting to really have a lot of longitudinal studies, which means we have time in them. They're like five-year, 10-year studies, which are offering information on the journey of LGBTQ kids. And these places are going to give you what we're looking at right now. And it's really exciting to, to understand this journey and see it at a deeper level. 
Um, so just to kind of start wrapping things up, I'm really hearing a lot just about being open with the, with the journey, affirming um, the positive regard, thinking of Carl Rogers, a lot of good information. And there's a lot of good resources that are available to families, groups, individual, um, as well as what we're gonna be sending out. So I just wanna thank you so much for coming. We've gotten through um, as many questions that we were able to get through tonight. Um, so concludes our presentation. Um, we're going to post a presentation on the Conejo USD YouTube channel, and it'll be up in just a couple of days. And we're also going to follow up with the additional resource page that um, John was talking about that we will be able to access. Um, we also want to say thank you, John, for coming. Love your um, enthusiasm and just your transparency, openness, and honestness. You can tell it really comes from the heart, and we just thank you for that. Um, just sharing your expertise and experience as well. Um, we also want to thank our parents for attending tonight's event um, presented uh, with, by the Caneo School Foundation and the Breakthrough Student Assistance Program. Um, we look forward to seeing at additional uh, future events and we just want to say thank you again and have a good night.